mind, body, and spirit, I call it. And um, it actually came when I saw a list of different psychological terms, and they were not put together in a very um, uh, practical way. I mean, there were things that belonged in certain places. I, I saw a structure for them, and I sort of based it on, on uh, human forms. And uh, so I, I start with the duality right away of, of male and female, which I got the signs. And of course, sexually, they got, you got the sperm and the eggs going in to create a baby. But you start on top with the mind, and basically this is a brain kind of thing with these different emotions within it. You know, fear, abandonment, hope, shame, guilt, desire, loneliness, trauma. Um, it's a very troubled mind. But uh, then you have, you know, the face, basically the eyes, you got, you know, you got the sun, you got yin, or yang rather, and then you got yin, which is the uh, female, the moon, basically, and, uh, I have on the sides, I have uh, some astrological signs just for the basic pure uh, pictography of, of them. Actually, they're not all represented. Um, you know, it's, it's like, uh, and then you got down into this sort of rib cage kind of thing where I have a more bodily oriented uh, uh, terms, you know, birth energy, birth death, energy balance, sexual, sexual identity. And um, and then I have the word spirit, which is on the bottom of all places. I don't know, it just seemed like a good place to do it. Spirit maybe being, uh, I'm not really that cognizant of, of the, the Eastern philosophical aspect of it. However, I believe spirit has to do with one of the lower chakras anyway. I don't know, to me it does. This is, I got my religion from uh, Prince the artist actually where he combines sexuality with spirituality in a very poignant way, I would say. But down here I have, um, you know, different uh, uh, terms, uh, prayer, meditation, family, community, consciousness, higher power, God, faith, peace. So the hierarchy of it going down, I mean, peace is, is the main thing. That's where it's all at. And um, in, in the piece, I have something down here, which I don't have anymore. I had the same, but, um, and that, that's, that, that's basically it. My name is Bernie Michael Glintz. I am a psychotherapist for more than 40 years of my life and I have worked with many adopted, adopted clients. I've spoken at many adoption conferences and appeared on national television a few times regarding controversial adoption issues. I'm a believer that being adopted plays a vital role in the outcome in a person's life and I have a specialty or subspecialty in understanding those issues. I also, I'm proud to say that I am also adopted and have, have a natural, obviously, kinship to the whole field and a desire to help adopted people wherever, whatever I can. Adopted children either know in their hearts they're adopted, I think we all do, or they all do, and for many reasons, adopted children deny any impact or relevance to being adopted. And the reasons for that are many, fear, anxiety, and a sense of disloyalty to their adopted parents to whom they feel greatly, in many ways, indebted for having adopted them. Adopted people have a lot of ideas and a very rich and fertile fantasy life in terms of what could have been if they were not adopted. Perhaps being out on the street, terrible things happening to them, almost like a lost puppy. In fact, a lot of adoptees report that they have always felt lost, lost in space, not anchored, not connected, and you will see time and again how adoptees have issues. 
Adoptees are loving, although scared, and really afraid to find and be themselves. But the problem is that of identity, because an adoptee truly does not know who they are. And from what I read about Michael, he found art to be his identity. And something I heard very importantly in listening to the tribute to Michael Canarac, which was beautiful, was that art was his lifeline to life. And it was almost like the umbilical cord to life and living. But sadly, what I also read into about Michael is no matter how much he perceived, he was insatiable, much like a person who could eat forever and still feel hungry. And the pain in him was so acute, from what I can gather, that he found drugs and drinking and alternative states of consciousness to be the way to survive, otherwise known as numbing out. And that art is something he felt safe with, trusted, because he trusted himself. Adoptees have issues, core issues, with trust because they don't understand the paradox, which is the story they're told, or we're told, that our birth parents or mother wanted us. But we don't go beyond that only to question, if we were so wanted, why were we given away? And there are many, many terms regarding the giving away from relinquishment, getting gotten rid of, whatever way it is dressed up, in my opinion, at a core, very, very primal place. Adoption is where an adoptee feels intrinsically unwanted, unloved, undesired. Adoptees that I have worked with throughout my career, they report a very hollow emptiness in their soul, in their core, that could never be filled up. And they think love, sex, rock and roll, drinking, drugging, you name it, would help fill that up, and it never does. Because as much as an adoptee needs to be connected is how afraid we are to be connected at the same time. And you see many adoptees having struggles with relationships because of trust and attachment and intimacy, anxiety we call it, because there's always the fear of being abandoned again and again, or rejected is something again and again. In my field, we call it primary process and secondary process. Well, what does that mean? It means that we're, when we're very young infants, we don't organize thoughts and feelings and reality. We just go with our drives and our instincts, and they're all over the place. Yes, and that was Michael. And you could see a lot in Michael's work of love and hate, aggression, right? A certain kind of macabre aspect, an erotic, a lot of eroticism in his art. And a lot of this, to me, speaks to developmental arrest and fixation, which means Freud mentioned, much to the chagrin of many, he called it his you know, uh, psychosexual model of the mind, the id, the ego, the superego. And he also had what was called the topographical model of the mind, the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the unconscious mind. It's my belief, and it's been over again my 40-year history as a therapist and working with so many people, that we are governed by a lot of unconscious, that is those things we're not aware of, feelings, thoughts, anxieties, issues, conflicts that we have not yet resolved, which translates into behavior, quite often maladaptive behavior, self-destructive behavior. The paradox of the Michaels of the world who were adopted is no matter how good 
they are or told they don't believe it and there's always strive about their undoing and self-fulfilling prophecy of self-destruction because they don't feel they're worth it they feel devalued they feel un un not understood not loved but Michael could believe in my view his art Michael is the one thing he maybe felt safe with in terms of himself in terms of that ability and where he felt safe. And he had an awful lot of issues, I would imagine, with women. Why women? Well, in the adoption world, we believe that adoptees struggle with a lot of unresolved conflicts with their birth mothers. Why their birth mothers? Because no matter what, no matter how you dress up the story in idealized terms, and romanticize terms. Adoptees at the end of the day end of the day feel gotten rid of. And really deeper down often don't trust the adopted parents because of their motives. You adopted me, why? You told me you did for me? No. I don't believe that anymore. You did it for you. So adoption, therefore, was self-serving, as if you used me, as if I was exploited. Now, I know this is going to be met with a lot of pushback by a lot of wonderful, loving, caring, adoptive parents, and there are so many out there. But I'm talking about the adoptees we see in, in our consultation rooms. So, for example, statistically, Adoptees comprise maybe two, a little bit more, perhaps close to 3% of our population, but represent over 6% on mental health roles. That is, those adoptees who come for treatment in psychology. And those are only the ones that step forward or come forward, because many don't have the resources or the ability to seek treatment or are too afraid to. Also, adoptees represent over 25 to 35 percent of patients in inpatient facilities in psychiatry, substance abuse, and other residential treatment facilities. Not to mention a correlation of crime and 10 times more prone, or 17 times more prone, even as high as that, to maladaptive outcomes in their lives as, compa as compared to their non-adopted peers. Adoptees live a very secretive, troubled life of which they're too afraid to go near and certainly too afraid to let anyone know, sadly, even their adoptive parents, for fear of getting gotten rid of again. So to recreate the trauma. It's not unusual for adoptees like Michael, perhaps, that when they were in relationships with women, they had to unconsciously create a self-fulfilling prophecy where the woman rejects them, gets rid of them, abandons them, much like what Freud called the repetition compulsion in terms of the same anxiety, the same dynamic. Often adoptees feel robbed and cheated as referenced earlier and therefore not unusual for adoptees to feel entitled you owe me world and it's not also unusual to see a high incidence of kleptomania or stealing an adoptees for feeling they were robbed they were robbed of their birthright robbed of uh, their identities and robbed of the genealogical weakle continuity. And so I'm angry. We're angry. And what I've tried to do personally is sublimate whatever issues I have in a positive direction, in a constructive direction, in helping my fellow adoptees in terms of dealing or navigate this most very difficult and complex landscape. And I do believe that Michael had a love affair, and I know this may sound re just outrageous. I think Michael had a love affair with his birth mother. 
And the woman that he continues to see might have been her. For example, and just for a quick moment, referencing an experience I had in my life. Throughout my life, I had a recurrent dream, an image of a woman with reddish brown to auburn hair peering down at me with big blue eyes throughout my life, not knowing that I ever had any idea knowing who she was, obviously, until I had a reunion with my birth mother, and lo and behold, to no surprise to the listener here, my birth mother had the auburn hair, the big eyes, the blue eyes, and I could see her smile on her face as I lay in the maybe in uh, in the hospital room, right in the bassinet, peering down at me, but sad eyes. Why well, sad? Knowing that she would have to give me up. And although it's erratized, I think of a lot of the love energy we could call libido was maybe transformed not into proper actual sex but loving strivings for this woman. Mm -hmm. And that what he could feel that he could not articulate perhaps could have been more in his erogenous zones. Maybe the breast is something he longed for. We could say psychoanalytically for his birth mother. Perhaps speaking to this hollowness where he's still longing, or he was, forgive me, for that breast if you will, not in an erotic way, but in a way of bonding and a physical connection, right, of nurturance, and also depicted in his art, where you see absolute themes of rage, of violence, of love, of longing, and that sadly, I'm gonna predict that Michael never got into any type of deep analysis or work on himself to put together all of these right diffuse disparate parts of his psyche and he just continued in a way to survive to put it all into art and that was his survival mechanism rightly so but as we were so to speak given up or gotten rid of a lot of adoptive parents are afraid that their adopted children will get rid of them which is why I believe they are so threatened when the adopted child mentions, mentions, alludes to desires for a search of their birth families. That they, in fact, will be again. Now the adoptee has control, right? The other thing about control, if I control you, so the theory or logic goes, there's a less chance that you will get rid of me. So the adoptee feels and lives with severe abandonment anxiety. By that meaning, I will be gotten rid of by you, my adoptive family, or parents, much like my original mother and or father got rid of me. And I think any relationship, they would have to be in control. Where they're in a position, either one, of getting rid of the person they're with, perhaps if it's a woman, a guy, but it doesn't matter, versus the other way around. Although adoptees, as mentioned, can also do the flip side of this and recreate the repetition compulsion or the original trauma time and time again. In the end, feeling despair, frustration, depression, anger, sustaining the emptiness. Everything and anything to get away from what he thought Michael was. That's how much I think pain he was in and the sense of self-loathing. And the pain was so excruciating that a thousand packs of cigarettes or 10,000 drinks a day may have helped in the short run in those hours, but only made matters worse. Michael is one of many who shot himself in the foot so many times there weren't any toes left, that he would always find a way to create his own undoing or create such an identity issue that I will, Michael Canarac, be the little adopted infant that was gotten rid of. 
and let me give you some reason to get rid of me. Michael was greatly influenced, as we all are, adopted and unadopted alike, with genetic factors, genetic issues. And so Michael conceivably was taking psychotropic drugs, different medications, the bipolar disorder, probably depression. But unfortunately, alongside that, he was drinking himself into oblivion. But Michael was the prince. And you know what? Rightly so. Maybe his mother longed for a child and, if you will, God descended on her and presented her a wonderful gift of Michael. Right. Michael the prince. But with all that, sadly, did Michael truly interpret that as love? Was it ever good enough? And I have empathy for them because it must have been incredibly frustrating and exasperating that no matter what they did, for a woman I could see that ever went out with him, you could never win because Michael would make sure at the end of the day it would always fail. Many of Michael and or the an adoption issue is right here when Michael speaks of in, in here, he writes the word fear, abandonment, hope, as in being hopeful, but hopeless at the same time, shame, which is very common in adoptees, trauma, no question a lot of it, the birth trauma, trauma that he witnessed, loneliness, total loneliness and aloneness, where all he had was himself, but the art, and the himself was not good enough, which is why he had, an, again, escape through drugs, a desire, and guilt, perhaps, for some of these terrible, angry, aggressive impulses and feelings that he had. He speaks about birth here and death. I could imagine that Michael may have suffered with depression so long that he did have suicidal tendencies. Energy, seeking balance, and interestingly, sexual identity, which may presuppose the idea that Michael may have even in his own right struggled with that. He used prayer meditation, family community, a higher power consciousness, and faith to find what was so missing in Michael Canarac, namely inner peace. This is fabulous. Mind, body, and spirit.